Love podcasts, hate nonces. It's the Politics Joe Pubcast. Woo! 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 Ow! <laughs> Fuck yeah. And on this most auspicious of occasions, because it's also unsung hero of Politics Joe, Sean Hickey's birthday today, whilst we record this. Who's have, that? Yeah, who is that? Who's uh, It's just in my notes that I need to say that. Um, no. Sean Hickey from Politics Joe, our content editor. Like I said, unsung hero, it's his birthday. So everyone, if you could wish Sean a happy birthday, that'd be much appreciated. Drop Guys. a happy birthday in the comments, for yeah, Sean. Drop a HBD in the comments, for <laughs> Sean. Um, Ava, you're back. Great to have you back. How was your holiday? Thanks. Well, rested? No, I didn't sleep at all last night. Great. It's really good, yeah. <laughs> um, you've just come back from the Jeremy Vine show. How was it? An enjoyable time? Yeah, do you know what? It was really quite a lot of fun, but I think I've used all my good points there. So uh, <laughs> Nothing to say now. We'll Fantastic. give this a go. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll give it our best shot. Um, no, yeah, it was good. We had a really good chat actually about Suella Braverman, which I hope we get into it again. Yes, I suspect we will. Um, Ava, obviously Politics Joe's political correspondent and... Politics Joe's golden boy, Ed Campbell, our <laughs> politics producer, other than Sean Hickey today because it's his birthday. Uh, Ed, how are you? You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you? Yes, not too bad. Not too bad. All the better for being sat here with you two lovely people. And our topic of conversation today is, of course, the National Conservatism Conference, um, which for your sins, Ed, you spent the last two days reporting at. What's mm -hmm. the vibe? How is it? <sighs> how, well, unfortunately, we haven't been allowed in. Yeah. <laughs> Along with other more independent alternative media we haven't been allowed into the conference itself as a, along with uh, open democracy byline novara we were excluded i think i think the reason they gave it they gave for not accrediting us was that there was too much demand but, but there's been wide reports of, of empty seats <laughs> 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 there's just simply simply isn't space for uh, for us but i did hear they had to zoom in to the crowd to make it look like there was a full <laughs> just just angles stage. being like um, yeah but you also said that even the journalists who have been allowed in, there's some quite bizarre rules about what they can and can't yeah, do whilst they're in there. But this is bizarre. So a journalist I know who was accredited for the conference said that there's really strict rules about what they can and can't film at the conference. So it's a conference with speakers. So if you're making a video, I don't know, you'd quite like to film, film the speakers. I'd say that's your only reason to go. They're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to film the speeches. They're not allowed to speak to anyone attending that's not a speaker. That's not a designated speaker. So you're not allowed to speak to the people who are attending the conference. You're only allowed to speak to the people that the conference wants you to speak to. The conference isn't being streamed anywhere. So no one from the outside can see it. There's no video documentary evidence of the conference and they're controlling, um, they're putting out their own clips, but they're not putting, as far as I'm oh, aware. Oh, I thought that I was gonna say, how comes we've seen clips? Yeah, so they, they're picking and choosing. Yeah, they're publishing So you're telling clips. me what they put out, they actually wanted to get out. <laughs> <laughs> but, Insane. But, but, it's, it, but it's, it's so strange, isn't it? Like the whole thing, well, it's, they're making a big play about free speech. And I think mm. a, part, a part of that is that we welcome, we welcome debate. That's what everyone kept saying to me. I, I was, thankfully, because I was not accredited, I was free to, to, just, to talk to whoever I wanted. And quite a few people I spoke to made a big thing about we're not um, we're interested in free speech and free debate, and that's why we're here. I don't know. I'm not sure the con the organisers of the conference are that keen on the the free debate. Yeah. So I mean, this provokes questions about what national conservatism is, what the point of the conference is. Um, very fortunately, we've been joined by Tom Jones, uh, not that one. A, he's actually a <laughs> conservative councillor and writer um, who's been on the conference floor. And I spoke to him earlier, and he explained to me what national conservatism actually means. Roll the clip. Tom Jones, thanks very much for joining me in the podcast studio. We're sat at the opposite ends of a table, sort of like Putin during the cold, the um, the COVID years when he was making all sort of the Western politicians sit opposite him. Does that make me Emmanuel Macron? You can be Macron. I'll be I'll be Putin. There we go. How's that? How's that fair? Um, you are a writer of a well, a very good Substack, which I'd encourage everyone um, to check out. Writing about all sorts of things, but most pertinently at the moment, sort of national conservatism where it sits. You've been at the conference most recently. Um, so, as an authority on such matters, would you be able to tell me, a philistine, what national conservatism is? What does it mean? Well, that was a really lovely introduction. I didn't didn't really deserve that. But then again, I've got curly hair, and I don't really feel like I deserve that either. <laughs> um, so, national conservatism is an American movement, and it is um, what's called a post-liberal movement. So it's a reaction basically against uh, what it sees as uh, increasing trends of globalization, towards globalization, that have eroded the nation state and also a um, 
uh, 50 years of kind of socially progressive uh, politics that have focused on the liberalization of the individual as the sole end of politics. Mm. And it's a kind of counterweight to that that sees, I suppose, a bit returny, really. It wants to return to um, the making the nation state the primary kind of building block. It wants to uh, reinstitute, um, place quite heavy importance on family. Um, because it's an American movement, places quite a lot of um, stock on God. And in terms of economics, it talks a lot about more protectionist policies, um, way more interventionist than, than conservatives would normally be comfortable with. Um, so it's, it's kind of trying to rebuild the idea of uh, a nation state around a cohesive um, uh, polity, basically. What do you see as the key points of difference between, let's say, a sort of uh, current modern contemporary, what are you going to call it, sort of post-liberal socialist response? Because I think a lot of people with sort of a more progressive left-wing politics, let's say, they'd, they'd probably agree with a lot of these national conservatives on the diagnosis of the problem mm. in, in, in Britain, um, whether it's you know the state of public services, infrastructure, local economies, communities. What's the point of difference with the solutions to those problems? I actually, I think a lot of the times that the solutions are actually broadly quite similar. Mm. So I think, you know, for instance, you know, we talk about the rebuilding the foundation blocks of the economy. Basically, everybody under the age of 45 agrees what the problems are, and it's not building enough infrastructure, and it's not building enough housing. Yep. Um, and actually, a lot of those, a lot of the policy solutions are very, very similar. Mm. Um, but in terms of the differences between kind of traditional socialism, it still doesn't believe in a redistributive state. Yep. It still believes in a. Um, it it places more emphasis, I suppose, on the state pro playing a more preventative than palliative role. So it, it wants a much stronger state that is able to step in before um, economic problems become social catastrophes rather than doing it afterwards, which it sees as fundamentally pointless and just leading to big government, which then erodes society and it erodes um, you know, things like the family because then you become um, more dependent on the welfare state. Mm -hmm. What do you see as some of the, the key tensions within the movement, within its ideology. It's very early days yet, particularly mm -hmm. here in the UK. So I've seen some of the, the criticism and discussion around national conservatism as an ideology that it's a little bit incoherent. But what do you, in your view, what are sort of the key tensions within it? Where are the points of difference? And how does, how might it struggle, perhaps particularly in its British context? Well, the big, the big uh, kind of tension is that it is an American movement and it is geared towards America. So it places a big importance on God, like it is quite religious um and it's not clear that that will fly here in fact no it is pretty clear it won't fly here let's be honest <laughs> yeah. like we are a completely secular nation uh -huh. um the other thing is it's not quite clear how that will sit with um a society that has like much higher participation rates in religion amongst non-christian communities um so religion is really one of the big things they've got to hash out but the other big thing um is the economy mm. so national conservatism conservatism talks a lot about the structure of the economy it talks a lot about um you know kind of more protectionist policies more intervention because the americans can afford to talk about the structure of the economy because they are pretty much by every measure the richest nation in the world and we are very much not that <laughs> you know gdp per capita we're now poorer than mississippi which is the poorest u.s state um our problems are not, well, we do have structural kind of problems in the economy, but the problems of our economy are foundational. And it's things like we haven't got enough housing. Mm. We have an absolutely fucking shit um, infrastructure system. Mm. We have really crappy transport. Um, we have a coming energy crunch that is going to be absolutely devastating to people. And unless we keep buying energy from abroad, it's you know it's going to push bills up. It's going to make last year look like a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. um, so taking on the kind of structure of the economy and the foundation is the I think the big thing that it needs to focus on. Would have been you've been in the room during the speeches. What's the sort of what's the vibe on the conference floor? And then we'll get into a little bit about what the speakers are saying and and who's left an impression. 
So I think the vibe is 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 broadly that kind of people are welcoming it for trying to turn post liberalism from kind of head in the clouds to feet in the mud. Yeah. And they're hoping it will be the start of something. But I think there are there have been a few tensions in the kind of speakers that have been there and the incoherence and the kind of baffling array of the ideologies of the speakers mm. that have left people kind of a bit confused. So I think if this were going to be national conservatism and this is how it is, I don't think it will fly because it's it's not even getting that strong a buy-in from the people that are there. Mm. But I think once it spins out and it starts to consider how it might work in Britain properly, then I think it, it you know it has room. There's been a few big beasts of the Conservative Party, capital C Conservative Party, um, addressing the conference, whose ideas, well, for me anyway, I think there's a question about whether or not some of the stuff that Suella Braverman was talking about, for example, I don't think she said something about where you begin doesn't really matter. And if you're talking about conservatism, then you really where you begin actually is quite relevant because you're talking mm. about a movement that's based, you know, find its roots in identity and tradition and mm. the, long, the long sort of sprawl of institutions. Um, and, you know, there's also quite a lot of sort of free market advocates going around that sort of, like you, I think you were saying at the top of this, that sort of individualistic, perhaps a little bit libertarian bent to it. Um, is there a, is there anyone really actually in the sort of Conservative Party itself who's advocating for these ideas or, you know, sits closely within it? Or do you think it's more that as part of the Conservative tradition, they are addressing the flaw, but they're not really proponents or adherents to the ideology that's being espoused here? What's your read on that? I think there are, there are people who speak to certain elements of it. Okay. So I think like Michael Gove is developing, uh, starting to acknowledge that actually we do need a slightly more protectionist economy. Mm. I don't think you could call Michael Gove a proper uh, true blue free marketeer anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, Braverman also is on board with their immigration policy, which is, you know, very, very restrictive, um, even though she is overseeing the highest immigration rate um, that this country has ever seen. It's <laughs> the um, small matter of being responsible for, for the yeah. immigration policy. Yeah. <laughs> a sister in Christ, you are responsible for the immigration <laughs> policy. <laughs> Um, so it's developing as a, as a, as a new movement, you know, it's yet to pull, I think a great deal of people in, um, I think Miriam Cates and Denny Kruger are probably the, the, the two MPs that are on it the most. Mm. They do some work with their, um, think tank, whatever it's called, the new social covenant unit that is talking very much about, um, kind of family policy and making family policy actually about family formation and not getting women back into work, um, which is a great idea. And, you know, you could be totally on board with that, but that also does need costing because like 78% of nurses, I think, are women. <laughs> so where are you going to find those? I mean, obviously not all of them are going to go off and become mothers, mm. but if you're not getting them back into the workforce quickly, that's how the economy is structured. So you need to, you need to come up with a policy costing for how you're going to make that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Kruger, Kruger said some interesting stuff. He, uh, I b believe the words Marx was right came out of his mouth on, on the floor to the, uh, to the he was talking about, uh, about the bourgeois middle class. So I think that's, it's interesting, isn't it? That, that's, that indicates to me a sort of degree of, you know, intellectual freedom and, you know, a willingness to sort of diagnose the problems in society. Because I think he was quite punchy about sort of the Conservatives' record in government, basically. You know, yeah. You're talking about austerity, talking about the things we were mentioning earlier. It's quite brave for a Conservative MP to take the stage and say those things to that audience because it's not like it's a private conversation in the red line, right? It's, it's punchy and it almost... I think it gives lie to the fact that actually there's quite a lot at stake here. You know, that really, I think the reason why this conference is of, of interest to me and to the podcast, you know, we're going to talk about it at length in the rest of, in the, rest of the episode with Ed and Ava, this is kind of the battle for the ideological soul of the Conservative Party. And depending on how our next general election goes, we could find ourselves with the party shifting towards this kind of NatCon type of ideology. If, you know, certain, a, a week is a long time in politics, obviously, and it's a long way away where anything could happen. But it's interesting that people are being that frank about it and forthright. I think it's... Um, Interesting, to say the least. I mean, yeah. a bit of a naff word, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I think this speaks to what I like to call the based sound dichotomy yeah. in the Conservative Party. <laughs> so, 
the battle for the soul of the party will basically be between the vast majority will be between oh, it's not really going to be a battle though is it no because we're going to have so few mps it's basically going to be a scuffle yeah um, <laughs> a minor altercation a steward shepherding someone out of a gig for heckling yeah yeah um there is going to be a um kind of sound caucus which will be you know probably reliant on the liz trust new liz trust think tank um it will be people like the asi and the iea who will be you know banging the drum for free market and free trade and then there will be a a whole kind of swath of um more new very much newer um you know think tanks like onward are mm. doing a project on this um nick timothy's leading on a future of conservative project that will i think be probably quite heavily post-liberal um and i think some of the other think tanks are looking to pivot towards this as well so there is going to be a battle between those two as well as you know the usual kind of continuity cameronism flying the flag for central sensible centrism mm -hmm. um so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Tom Jones, thank you so much for taking the time, coming to our studio to talk to us about this. Uh, like I said at the top, brilliant Substack. I'd encourage all of our audience to check it out if you want to understand internal conservative politics, the ideas that are floating around. It's well worth your time. So Tom, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ed, that's Tom's version of what national conservatism is, what it means. He's not a proponent of it, but you know he's on the floor and so he's able to explain kind of the ideas. Um, but that's sort of the ideas of the speakers. You've been speaking to the actual people who are attending mm. the conference. So if you could try and put your finger on if there's like any sort of cohe well, is there any cohesive kind of <laughs> ideology for these people? Like it's I know it's a nascent movement, so there's potentially not that not that many um like clear, coherent ideas that they all ascribe to because it's very early days right now. But what do they think? Mm. Well before I get into that, I just like to Describe Tom Jones as a friend of politics, Joe. Of course, sorry, <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. How could I, I, said, I forget? How could I forget? I was speaking today, and you, I think it'd be, it'd be remiss of us not to call him. Yes, that. yeah, my bad. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. These people. I think your point about it being, is there a cohesive movement? No, there's not. There's the theory of national conservatism, which plays to the ideas of nation state, the role of Christianity in society, the role of the family. But people I speak to, their priorities were genuinely all over the place. As in, like they were saying. Um, well, people were making points about uh, Christian evangelism. They wanted to see a greater role for Christianity in the country. People wanted to talk about free speech, as I mentioned earlier. There was quite a few people who I spoke to who are really quite socially conservative. And one man described the sexual chaos that's happening in Britain. <laughs> uh, wow. And he, he was... He, sexual chaos. Sexual chaos. So, um, I can think of, I can... My God, that's shall, so shall, great. Shall we play that clip now? Please. Describing sexual chaos. Roll the clip. Anybody who fathers children has a responsibility to those children. Any mother who has children has a responsibility to those children. Part of that responsibility entails maintaining a stable home life. And you can't do that in a world of sexual chaos and family breakdown. This is not, this is not the way to raise children, nor is it the way to achieve a healthy society. What's sexual chaos? Well, um, if you, if you tell people that they can indulge their um, sexual instincts without restraint, what you get is a lot of damaged individuals. They damage themselves and they damage others. The point about our sex drives is, I think, that um, it's incumbent on all of us to try to restrain ourselves and to live within um, the tolerable limits you know, no one's, no one's a saint. I'm not saying I am. But I think that uh, sexual restraint is something society has lost sight of. It's not a message that you hear being put to young, to young people. But sexual restraint actually is an essential component of a happy life. So that was sexual chaos, well described. <laughs> I'm sure we all have a key. Now, if you watch that on YouTube, you might have seen two dogs. <laughs> 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 but, I want to subscribe to his OnlyFans, but, but it sounds wild. But, it's like, but like, that I was really in the weeds with that conversation. I was like, what what world is this man living in in which there is sexual chaos? I, I, oh no, I'm Ed. Because I'm, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm absolutely not living in it. <laughs> but yeah, but he, he, like, he was really urging that everyone should have should the importance of sexual restraint.
Right. And I, I from like a morali- personal morality. I think so. It, it was morality, yeah. but he didn't seem. To, I don't think he was. He didn't mention faith to me. So I think he was just an old school social conservative. Right. And if you're trying to, if this is the, if these are the people trying to hijack the Conservative Party. I think less shagging isn't a vote winner. I think like <laughs> I think that that point there is is really crucial to put some context on this. Like you said, like um, as a conservative election strategy, right? Because the reason why this conference is interesting is if the way that politics looks like it's shaping up over the next eighteen months is that the Conservative Party loses the next general election, it prompts a load of soul searching. They're probably reduced to a rump of MPs in Parliament, and then there's this kind of ideological battle for what the Conservative Party thinks and does next and there's different strains of thought the national conservatives being one of them and their concerns about the widespread sexual chaos in this country <laughs> we're, we're, we're being a bit unfair to them and we'll obviously go we'll go deeper into what they think later oh, on bloody hell <laughs> yeah that's going to be a, a wild ride what about a, a swingers party or dogging or something and they're like oh my god someone should stop this <laughs> Um, that reminds me of this incredible story of my friend who once run at, rung up the BBC news desk when he was a reporter in Wales because he thought a tanker had run aground and he thought like crowds of people had gone to look at it. And when he turned up, it was just loads of people dogging. <laughs> he had to ring back the news desk and apologise. No worries. Imagine there's a, there is a genuine electoral coalition of like these tiny villages or hamlets which are dogging hotspots because <laughs> they are genuinely there is a there is sexual chaos in these places and like so they are natcon voters for sure oh absolutely um and then there's kind of you know there's a couple of other tribes right within the conservative party there's probably the sort of like trussite free markets libertarian indiv- individualistic type strain of thought and then probably what's left of a kind of one nation Cameroon, the, the you know the ones that weren't purged by Boris Johnson, you know, so who aren't David Gork, um, Rory Stewart, and that kind of character, and of those three rough tribes, there's kind of going to be this battle, right, for what the Conservative Party uh, thinks next. I mean, Ava, how would you, if you were to talk about Rishi Sunak's Conservative Party, not necessarily National Conservatism, so just to put a bit more context on this before we go into Nat Cons in a bit more detail. How would you characterise Rishi's conservative administration? What do you think? What do you th- if you had to sort of put a put an ideological bent on it? What is it? Hmm, would have been really handy for you to ask me this before we came on. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a nice thing about it. Like, I'm going to sit in silence for forty five minutes yeah. while you think about it. Um, you know, I actually think it doesn't know what it is. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of um, Tory MPs know that they're in marginal seats and they probably will lose their seat at the next election. And I think some of them are now clawing on the kind of populist rhetoric that, you know, the uh, close our borders, stop the votes, that sort of thing to bring back some populism, populist votes. And then there's some others, maybe like the Danny Krugers who made a big appearance at this conference who are thinking, no, let's go back to small C conservatism. Let's talk about the nuclear family. Let's talk about Christianity, getting, you know, getting that back on, uh, at play um yeah i think it really doesn't know what it is and I, I think actually rishi especially doesn't know what it is because he's actually just have you ever just thought that he's just too young as a politician not in his age but like in in terms of how long he's been a politician to be prime minister is there not a point about there isn't there's no such thing as a sunakite as in there was no yeah, momentum sure. in the party for when, for when he became prime minister he was forced through by the parliamentary conservative party as kind of being like, okay, we need, who's the most boring option we have, the yeah. least divisive option we have to stop the chaos of trust, to try and like stem the flow of the, the blood from the wounds of <laughs> Trust and Johnson. So he, lo- he he didn't win in the popular vote in the, when he was up against Trust, he didn't win when, went, when they went to the party members. Mm-hmm. There's no one who speaks. It's also, it's not quite embarrassing. Like he's prime minister. And people are already talking about like who's the what, what the next guy is going to do. Is yeah. there's no one talking about what his legacy is? Like even and I agree with that. There's no point because he's not going to have a legacy because he's going to get roasted. It's but I be- also think it's unfair to say that Suella Braverman is like making a play. Not unfair, but I think it's I think it's too simplistic to say that Suella Braverman is making a play to be prime minister. Like I think this huge this massive right wing rhetoric that she's come out with in her speech that is. It was signed off by the Home Office. That was signed off by number 10. She is a tool for the Conservatives right now to pull Rishi's narrative more right and actually make the party look more interesting. I'm really interested by Suella's speech because uh, large parts of it were sort of bemoaning 
the current Conservative government's immigration policy, for which she is directly responsible. Mm. Uh, it's a it takes a certain amount of bollocks to go up there yeah. and be like, man, our immigration policy fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, ah, Suella. When I get my hands on the person in charge of our immigration policy, yeah. they are going to be... No, for sure. It's and like Ollie going, who the fuck put me in this shirt? <laughs> God, I really... What are you trying to say about the shirt? God, I really hate all that content poll that Joe makes. <laughs> someone, someone should do something about See, that. Um, so there's that. Then there's also just the general principle, right, of collective responsibility, of which, as a cabinet minister, she is allegedly a part of, i.e she supports the government's agenda so when you say that she's not sort of pitching herself here as a leader i don't i struggle to comprehend or understand what she had to say in terms because like how can you go out there and and if you're bemoaning the policies that you're enacting what are you doing if not rolling the pitch and preparing the conservative minded maybe members people who will vote for you about your views in advance of a, uh, a conservative leadership election. Like, what, what, what's, she, what's she doing if it's not that? Is it possible if the Tory party doesn't know what it is at the moment, they also don't know what sort of voter they're trying to appeal to. So maybe each cabinet minister just sort of rolls up with a different interpretation <laughs> of the manifesto. <laughs> Fucking it'll play. <laughs> something sticks. You know, like at Christmas, Should we people rejoin buy the EU? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, no, not that. Oh, no, 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 no. Who said that? that? Who <laughs> said that? <laughs> Should we join the... <laughs> <laughs> on the... On that point about what Rishi thinks, though, you know, he's... Um, I think you can make an argument that he's pretty authoritarian, right? You know, you, 100%. You look, yeah. at, look at the sort of the Public Order Act, Police um, Crime Court Sensing Bill, you know, deeply, deeply restrictive legislation that impinges on civil liberties in a really quite extreme way. You know, he um, he invoked, was it Section 22, the thing that stops stops the Scottish government mm. from... Some, something, like something, like something like that, right? Some section, whatever. And <laughs> the, what's, what's, the, what's the first instance of it being used? It's to block gender self-ID. Um, banning laughing gas. Like, th this is really like social, like weird socially conservative, like... It's it's really authoritarian. I think his politics. I think I think people because of the vibes of the the Tory election contest, where somehow he was seen as the sort of liberal Silicon Valley type, and Liz Truss was the 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 sort of arch right wing thinker. Even though she was a Remain campaigner, he was a Lever. Their politics really quite far apart. I think the vibes of that contest have kind of seen Rishi painted as this sort of liberal, almost a Cameroon. Whereas in actual mm -hmm. fact, when you look at the things that they're doing e.g. protesters getting nicked at the coronation for wearing t-shirts and doing nothing else. That's, those are really socially authoritarian, socially conservative positions to take. Mm -hmm. The vibes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have a funny story about seeing Suella yesterday. Go on, shoot. So um, there's a back door at the conference. <laughs> also, the conference is in an evangelical church. Mm. It's not... It's, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, I think... Can we point <clears throat> out that it is a... You know, it, as states, it's an American. Oh yeah, sorry. It's also it's also it's, it's an American group that have, have organised this thing, and there's been other ones in other conferences in Miami, etc. It's really like an American style event. It's very American heavy and foreign. Um, but there's a there's two entrances: the front entrance and the back entrance. And there was word word had spread to me and the protesters hanging outside uh, that Suela um, would be appearing at the back door. And we've been thinking about that. Um, How many times you can you say backdoor in this? Backdoor. I know, and I'm, all I'm thinking is Richard is furious. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, so I, I thought perhaps she'll be walking. So we'd discussed beforehand what if, if I got the opportunity to doorstep Suella, what, what should we ask? And we kind of decided to be like a, a, gra a grabby, how do you sleep at night? Mm. So a ministerial car pulls up to the back door. I'm standing about a meter away. There's going to be like, a, you, you'll be able to see her for 10 seconds. So I think, okay, I'll go for the really punchy. I'll only ask, how do you sleep at night? But what I said instead was, do you sleep well? <laughs> For fuck's sake. <laughs> do, you, do you sleep well, Home Secretary? <laughs> I, oh my God, I think I heard that. I feel like I saw a Steve Bray video. No, it does. Some, we put it in our own content. <laughs> Are you sleeping well? This is like what... you look well rested, home secretary. <laughs> this is this is like what I said to Ava at the beginning of the podcast. Oh, rested time on holiday. No, I slept terribly. You've basically had like a bit of small talk with the home secretary. Brilliant, brilliant journalism, Ed. Um, you've done a great job there. You look wonderful. <laughs> um, 
let's talk about religion in this in this in this thing, right? Because it's like you mentioned, it's American, and American politics has the kind of evangelical. Well, his his look, the Lord is omnipresent, as we all know. Mm -hmm. um, but he actually, you know, God is all over American politics in a way that probably since the Reformation, he's probably not <laughs> over British politics. I'm I mean, so happy we brought up the Reformation. I know it's like <laughs> this is fucking really good, engaging stuff. I know. Um, but British politics is secular. You know, yeah. You know, look look at what happened to Kate Forbes and Humza Yusuf, right, in, mm -hmm. the, in the SNP election. And, you know, any hint of kind of mainstream, like, oh, you're religious. It's like, well, you better fucking keep that religion to yourself, mm. Sonny. And the second it starts in your politics, we are not interested. She said she hated the gays. Well, I, I think there's possibly a fair few people at this conference who maybe hate the gays yeah, as well. Yeah, but I, I, um, I actually resent that religious, I, I resent that Catholic people, Christian people, don't, don't like the gays, sorry. You wanna go into just that in a bit I more am. detail? Well, just from, I just think about my parents and the church that my parents went to and the priest is gay and he also, um, this is gonna really narrow it down where they live. Um, he also <laughs> um, became a priest because Jesus came to him while he was on an acid trip in Brighton. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway. I think, I think you've got a specific experience of religion in Britain. Yeah, yeah, that seems like, that's like, I think Pope Francis could be so angry when he hears about this guy. <laughs> no, Pope Francis was actually, um, was, was coming around to the idea. I don't know if you've been- uh, Or this guy in particular. I don't or know just if in... you've been, no, been following uh, Pope Francis's discussions about the gays, but he's actually, yeah, no, he's, he's quite au fait. Hmm. I, there's an undertone right in this conference um, because they talk about the nuclear family, but it's quite explicitly a sort of male, female, uh -huh. mother and father and kids type deal. Mm -hmm. And it feels, well, it doesn't feel, I just think it's, a, that's homophobic. It's euphemistic. It? It's, yeah. if it, they all talk in euphemism. Go on. They all talk, so they all talk about, the people I've spoken to talk about a sense of belonging to your country, which I've taken to read as being ethnically homogenous, is my mm -hmm. interpretation of that, a creating a sense of collection and homogenizing and it not being diluted by people coming to the country, which I took to mean ethnically homogenous, homogenous culturally, <clears throat> culturally homogenous. They talk about um, the importance of the nuclear family, about the opportunity for mothers being able to stay at home God. and look after their children, things like that. The importance of, uh, Danny Kruger made a speech about, the, about talking about divorce and mother and how they, people make a, a commitment to each other and how that should be honored in a marriage, which kind of, I think, is people get divorced for uh, the, the the idea of criticizing no fault divorce in mm. a, in a in a modern Britain seems ludicrous. Like at what at what point? And it just seems incredible. It's not like there's a massive movement now. No one's on the doorstep mourning about. Oh, I divorced my husband. I, I regret it. Well, there's it? also Miriam Cates. She yeah. made that absolutely obscene speech mm -hmm. about um, well women should be providing more children. And it was cultural Marxism, which meant that the liberal elite who've gone to university aren't providing the next- um, Generation. Yeah, the next generation. I mean, as you know, we've covered many times throughout the last year, the spike in the cost of baby formula and how many people are stealing it because they simply can't afford it. And we always talk about housing on this program and how young people can't afford to live anymore in major cities. I'm gonna cue all of those comments again, but anyway, <laughs> I mean, it's almost farcical to then say it's cultural Marxism is the reasoning behind people not having babies. Like realistically, even if I was in a position to have a child, I would not be able to pay for it. And I have a reasonably all right job. Mm. You could pay me more, Ollie, but we're... This is not the vehicle for making, <laughs> for making <laughs> those claims. Drop a comment in the chat <laughs> if you think we should get a pay rise it's, above yeah. inflation. Um, <laughs> to play... put, in the, put in the chat how much each one of us is worth. Really, please don't do <laughs> how that. How much do you think we all earn? Um, <laughs> let's not play this game. Um, to, play de to play devil's advocate to you for a, for a second, Ava, um, they're talking, that, so, so they're saying, right, our birth rate is declining. And I think I, I think it's reasonable to accept that that's a problem, right? We have aging demographics. We are going to reach a point where the working age population in this country physically cannot support the welfare state because of the size of the pension payouts that we're going to have to be doing. That's like that's a big problem on mm. the horizon. As a society, we have to deal with it. And the NatCons, admittedly, it's laced with some really quite uh, unpleasant stuff about the role of women in the home and that sort of thing. And I, you know, reject that. But to say we need to build a million houses in this country mm. 
which is part of part of the of the idea, right? It's quite interventionist. It's quite pro infrastructure, pro building of houses. Are they not addressing the concerns that you're raising about unaffordable housing, about the cost of living? Are they not actually providing answers to those problems that you're talking about? No, because in that same conference, we were talking about fruit pickers and how people are too many people are <laughs> on welfare and not enough many not enough people are. Uh, working, or they're all on benefits, and that's really distracting me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, yeah, I'm just trying to place like, How place many my times can I in, say it? In, 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 in a non lounge in a non lounge way. <laughs> just like, just kept repeating it until your <laughs> the pint went. <laughs> um, Sorry. Anyway, no, yeah. I mean, in that same conference, yeah, we were talking about the scourge of welfare. I mean, 40% of people who are on universal credit are also in work. I mean, we have a real problem in Britain at the moment with salaries not being high enough to afford a living. And I'm not even talking about a living with children. I'm just talking about, you know, subsisting. Yeah. So yeah, sure. It's okay to point out that we've got a declining birth rate and you're going to build a million homes. Where are you going to build them? Because you've also managed to uh, <laughs> basically like, you know, carve out half of the UK and say that it's NIMBY land and we're mm. not building on it. So I think, so I think this is an important thing to me is, and that touches on, you're talking about the Conservative Party. These people are so fringe. These people actually aren't responsible for that. Like the National Conservative Movement aren't. And they're also so fringe. I think it's important to remember in the, when we're talking about this that these aren't the Conservative Party. The, yeah, Rishi Sunak's mm. not there. There are government ministers there. There are a few MPs. It's not. The, it's not like the Venn diagram slight of the two organisations slightly, slightly overlaps. I think. I think. I think. I kind of think. I'm going to paraphrase uh, Logan Roy. These are. These are not serious people. There's a bit. I'm at a speaker. Yeah, Darren Grimes was there. Darren Grimes was there, <laughs> friend of politics show. Uh, but also, I swear to God, a man whose name is Chris DeMuth, he said in a speech he was communing with Thatcher <laughs> and that she's on board with national conservatism. She's doing stairs. <laughs> <laughs> she's doing stairs. She's doing stairs. She's doing stairs. <laughs> uh, I th what I, did Thatcher say to Chris DeMuth? He's just like, oh yeah, no, she's on board with national conservatism. I don't think that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It, like, well, but also, the, I think there's... A, there's no way to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. Okay, look, you know, the, the Thatcherite economic consensus, right? Like hyper-individualism, yeah. almost, you know, well, it is neoliberalism. This is a post-liberal Yeah, they all talk about coming ideology. together at the end of the role of the individual. So, so he's lying. It's not true. Yeah. If she, it's, I, I, it's I know, <laughs> I know what she thinks, okay? I know what Dead Thatcher thinks. No, I... I it's an interesting <laughs> Overton window to pin you in there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, he's, but he's also, but this, but this guy is, uh, is he's, he's an American academic. So if yeah. Thatcher's going to commune with somebody, why would it be him? Why would it be him? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but where did he, I want to know more about this, the, the seance he's had. I think that's a really important point. Because, but the seance? No, <laughs> <laughs> about the politics of these people, because I kind of would push back on what you're saying, because one of the, the Home Secretary is speaking here, right? Mm. And she is one of, that is one of the great four officers of state. Mm. You know, the, gov the British government is well represented at this conference. Um, but her ideas, you know, she said, she said something about, you know, where we begin doesn't really matter. And so I'm going to break it to you if you're conservative, actually where you begin really is quite important because the entire fucking point of it is conserving tradition, roots, you know, uh, institutions. So if where you begin is... It, what are you? And that's kind of the point, I think. You know, she is more of that libertarian, free market type of thinking. And this conference isn't no. about that. And I find that really, really interesting that this this younger crowd that maybe not all of them ascribe to these ideas, but they're interested in them, that their actual political home might not naturally be the Conservative Party. Yeah. Yeah. And if it isn't, where do they go? And where does this political force go? And that, and that, I guess that's kind of a consequent. You know, we're talking oh, when these these ideological tribes in the Conservative Party battle it out. If the Nat, if if it's not NatCon, if the National Conservatives don't win that battle, where are the people who adhere to these ideas going to go? Green Party. Naturally, <laughs> I think. I think also as well, is there a point about so these so young people feel poli feeling politically disaffected by the political system at large. They're not necessarily automatically going to go to the left, as we know is well evidence that there are young right wing people. <clears throat> I think it's also as well, if you're watching the Tory party fuck over young people at every possible opportunity, why the hell would you keep voting for them? Why would you join them? Why why would you why wouldn't you try and spring up a new alternative right wing movement? 
an alt right. Ooh, <laughs> an alt right. Well, that is what Richard Tice is attempting to do with his Reform Party. It's pretty, with young people. Yes, he's actually really going after that. He's really like honing in on uh, policies like uh, graduate tax. Mm-hmm. Really getting into that. He's really looking at energy costs. Well, is, is, he doesn't. Is, is it that he doesn't want anyone to pay income tax for the first twenty grand there? Yes. Um, and he wa- I mean, it's quite extraordinary policy. I mean, some of the um, some of the energy policy is is like, no, we're going to make ourselves completely self sufficient. But in doing so, he wants to do it out of fossil fuels. So that's that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Suella Braverman. I do think it's interesting that you can be that anti immigration and you can say something like, "It's not where you begin." Mm. Like. Well, it kind of is, Suella, and yeah. that's sort of what you're saying. In every facet. <laughs> um, yeah, I think when we're talking about that group of people and whether I, whether where their sort of electoral politics goes, you're, you're talking about a generation of people who have basically grown up post-financial crash in conservative Britain, in, auster- in austerity Britain. And if you look at your economic prospects in that time, you go, am I better off than I was at the beginning of this period of time? No, I'm not. I don't own anything. I don't have any assets. What is the point of me being a conservative when I have nothing to conserve? Like, that, that's the whole point, right? It's maintaining the established order, maintaining the status quo. The, 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 the electoral offering of a conservative party is, we will make you rich, and then we'll let you keep the things that you earn. So if you don't do the first part, why would anyone, why would anyone you know, stick stick with you. And I think this is the Financial Times is John Byrne Murdoch's done a really interesting graph about this, how typically, you know, the cliche is like, you know, if you're young and not left wing, you don't have a heart. If you're old and you're not right wing, you don't have a head. But actually in Britain, and this is only real, this is this sort of like a British, exceptionally British thing. It's not happening in other countries. Young people are not becoming more right wing as mm-hmm. they get older. There, there's, there's about 25, 25, there's a cohort of about 25% of the population under 30 who are broadly conservative in their leaning, but it's not getting any bigger as, as they age. And that could be a massive problem for the Conservative Party, absolutely massive, because mm-hmm. eventually their voters are gonna die out. And then what do they do? Well, it's like what you said about, I mean, this, this process of like you would join the, you know, if you're in the Conservative Party, you're gonna be able to make yourself rich and then be able to keep that. Well, there's a study out today that shows one in five people are paying 40% tax. In 1990, that was a salary of 100,000 pounds. That is now a salary of 52,000 pounds. Like 52,000 pounds is a lot of money, but it's not 100,000 mm-hmm. pounds. Yeah. That's not like, that. that's ridiculous that you'd pay 40% tax. We're not even counting in that, your, your graduate, your, your student loans in that. That's extortionate. Mm. So it, there is actually now this squeezed middle that means like, you know, people who've worked hard all their life, they might have owned a shop, they might have been a teacher or a nurse, they've accumulated a little bit of wealth. They're paying so much money in tax now. They can't go on holiday. They can't go out for dinner on a Friday night. What is the point of voting for the Conservatives? Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think there's, um, there's, there is actually, I know I'm talking, in, we're talking in like really broad generalizations, but there is a strain of the population that's actually done quite well out of low interest rates and cheap credit. So, you know, new build home, possibly two cars on the drive in regional England. Um, you can sort of have a bar at home and keep that going with, you know, sort of a trade a trade income, plumber, electrician or something. And then let's say, I don't know, um, call center manager, nurse, teacher, or whatever, those two salaries can put that together. Your economic aspiration until Liz Trust tanked the economy was a nicer bottle of wine with dinner or, you know, a holiday to a better destination in Europe or maybe a longer trip to, let's say, the Caribbean. But all of that fundamentally relied on cheap credit and it, and it relied on artificially low interest rates. And now that those things have gone and all of a sudden every single piece of furniture tech that those guys have bought on credit that's linked to either RPI or CPI has suddenly become significantly more expensive, their quality of life is going down and who they go and vote for is a big question because I don't think, like like you said, you know, why would you want to conserve that material condition if it's getting worse? There's, there's not really an appeal there, is there? And I don't think that the current conservative government cares. I really don't. I, I think that they are appealing to the sort of imagined person that they don't actually understand. 
They don't care about these people who've bought on credit and you know want to just have a, you know a nice bottle of wine with dinner. They're going after this weird, rabid, gammon-faced voter <laughs> that um, it spouts crap on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's bizarre. I think it's a caricature that guy that you're describing there. Like I, I think broadly speaking, most people in this country, if you hear, for example, Suella Braverman's rhetoric around refugees, I think most people hear that and go. Really? Yeah, like, that's, no, but that's, that's who grim. she's pitching to is what I'm arguing. No, 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 I understand. I oh, understand right. that. I'm just saying that I, you know, th- that that person that they've created in their heads, I'm not sure how much, like, how, how representative of the population yeah, is. Yeah, I don't know how yeah, many people there are yeah. that, like, that are so you know, unch- unsympathetic. Ben mentioned this on the last episode, mm-hmm. right, where we were talking about trans rights, and he was saying, you know, Nadia wins Big Brother, right, and there's barely a peep. Mm-hmm. Um, that character in Corrie, you know, there's not there's not a big outrage about it, and all of a sudden, you know, trans rights is this huge. You'd think it was this huge like contest, cultural thing, and obviously as it builds momentum, it does end up becoming that. But you forget that 20 years ago, people weren't asked. No, you know, you want to oh, you want to be trans? There's, be my guest. You know, a, a man I met yesterday, he said he was not political until his retirement, and what Here we fucking prompted go. him to get into the, what politicized him was. The trans debate. He was said he was he was concerned about what his dr- granddaughters were being taught in school about the dangers of Stonewall oh, so and mermaids. Bloody hell! It's so nice him to get up and care about his grandkids <laughs> when we were talking about the rape conviction rate being so low. Do you know what I mean? It's, oh, it's, it's, change. I think I think it's I think it's quite astonishing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, a much bigger. Like we talked about this. You and I talked about this at our um, PMQ's reaction about like yeah. climate change will kill kids mm. us probably if the climate but, climate change suddenly became non-binary do you think oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah and um, the climate is uh, trans now yeah, so you have yeah. to you have to hate it yeah. global global Sun's sea levels out, rising yeah. are are trans and they're non-binary <laughs> and they're pansexual and you can you can kill it if you <laughs> if you stop driving your big car when uh, the ice caps melt uh-huh. they actually become he uh-huh. he him this, this electric vehicle is a cisgender man but we're not calling it cisgender. And it's that... competing in the national <laughs> swimming finals. <laughs> <laughs> this electric vehicle just won the triathlon. <laughs> this, this, this electric vehicle just won the Monaco Grand Prix. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Um, Ed. I'm going to try and get a grip on this. No, don't. Um, <laughs> Ed, Michael Gove uh, said while well, he addressed the crowd at NatCon uh, that it was great to see such vibrancy of ideas on the centre right of our politics. Um, what do you think? What do you make of that? I think I think it's just very funny that he's just trying to create his own Overton window. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I did it earlier. You didn't get it. <laughs> that was a line that Ollie came up with uh, before before the show started and told us. Um, oh, yeah. Last time I do that. That's all I've, at least of a tribute. manifesting is what I said. Uh, so you did. It was better. It was better. Yeah. But I'm attributing the idea to you. Thanks. Um, crediting you. Uh, yeah, I think. But I think. I think you're. <laughs> I think you're bang on. I think it's very like you talked about the vibrancy of the ideas of the centre right, and I don't know. I think Nashin. If you think the centre right, like who do you think of when you think of centre right? I think what? of like. Kamala. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> tell me, tell me about some of the ideas of the people who are speaking at this conference. Like when he says ideas on the centre right, what actually are we talking about here? What's some there's, of the stuff they've espoused before in the past? Yeah, there's just there's just an astonishing array. There is some people who are just quite like who aren't national conservatives speaking. Councillor Tom Jones, friend of the podcast, ascribed that to being to give it some intellectual heft. He basically says there's not enough national conservative thinkers to have an entirely natcon conference but there is there's there's ties of national conservatism to things like the great replacement theory um there's things there's talk, talking about this some of the language used has been uh, described as anti-semitic to talk about can you just explain what the great replacement theory is for listeners and also darren grimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah the great replacement theory is essentially the idea that immigrants and migrants and refugees are attempting to replace the white indigenous western culture if you take on essentially if you take on refugees or people of color largely <clears throat> the um cu- british culture or western culture will be so diluted that will be replaced by an alien culture and, and it's it's a, it's a far right conspiracy theory and at its most extreme end as well it actually talks about the replacement of people right mm. and that's why the birth rate is kind of a buzz is a buzzword and a buzz topic of conversation mm. because 
the implication is that basically people of color and usually most often it's muslims they're talking about mm -hmm. are basically going to outbreed the indigenous white population and then the country will end up becoming a muslim country yeah so it's not it's not a center right it's not <laughs> yeah. i don't think are onwards talking about this <laughs> No, I don't think they are. Although Seb Payne might, if it means he gets to become a conserv conservative MP. Oh, oh. Ah! <laughs> I'm full of them today. I'm full of them today. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, but it's describing not only is like it is remarkable that there are conservative ministers appearing at this conference in which those ideas are discussed, and then describing. I don't, I don't know if it's if it's willful trying to include them in the Overton window, manifesting them into the Overton window. Stop saying Dartmoor Twenty Three, um, <laughs> or. It, or trying to give him some credence so for when he eventually becomes the leader of the Conservative Party he can use that use that rhetoric, rhetoric himself I don't I don't think that's what he's going to do but it's just the whole the whole thing is just remarkable yeah because none of them have a clue circling back to that Overton window what are, what, what are our buzzwords Overton window and back door yeah. Circling back to Gove's Overton back door. Back door goal. I think, yeah. You look well, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the porn starts. Yeah. Yeah. None of them have a clue what they want or that, who they're pitching to. That was um, another good another good clip. Um, I spoke to a woman yesterday who I, I, you have to ask, you just have to ask these people about what woke means mm. because they talk about it all the time and they genuinely don't know what it means and they can't define it. So I asked a few of them and this woman had a great answer. Roll the clip. What does the word woke mean to you? What does the word woke? Oh, this is one of these questions that people try to uh, ask. And look, I think it's one of these things. It's like art. You know it when you see it. Or porn was the famous definition of that. Oh, that's, that's right. <laughs> porn, porn, porn. You know, it. you know it when you see it. I know it's art or porn or something. I mean, I guess you could say that you were the same. But um, yeah, you know it when you see it. I'd quite like that to become like Keir Starmer's answer to what is a woman. <laughs> you know it when you see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fuck's sake! <laughs> yeah, it's just it, it become. It become I, I I think a, a key a thing about this conference is it can become anything to anybody. It can become a cultural like bugbear to the left. Like point to that and say, look what the right are doing. They're associating with these people. To Michael Gove, it's a laboratory of the best centre right thinking in the world. It can. It's it's so wide ranging. And there's no cohesive argument to anything that they're saying. There's not like a, they're not coming up with a manifesto. They're coming up with, it's just like a debate, it's a conference. Mm. So it can become all things to all people at the moment. There isn't like a cohesive. Does that not make for quite a potentially politically successful ideology? If you can project your own feelings and ideas onto it. Yeah, probably actually. Yeah. But, oh, I, 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 but no, but, but as I said, I, I, I think in theory, yes. But when we've, nail down the tenets of national conservatism, which they've handily written in a 10-point a ten point principles. Darren Grimes also did not know about the e evangelical angle of national conservatism. Mm. He said he was surprised. He said he was surprised. I mentioned, do, how do you feel about the evangelical grand angle? And he's like, like religion? And I, said, I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I don't know. I'm just glad he's got out of his mum's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think, I, I also just don't think these things land in the UK. To be perfectly honest, I don't think. I, I think if you start talking about divorces and the role of Christianity in the state, I just genuinely don't think they're they're vote winners. Yeah, no, but neither is the Roman the Rwanda policy. I no. mean, you were talking about what Ben Smoke had to say about where people sit on the trans debate. It was like the polling about for conservative voters on Rwanda deportations was like sixty percent not in favour, not even like not sure or don't you know literally do not want to do it that's huge mm. but, but, i don't know what to say <laughs> should we call it yeah i feel like yeah. you're too happy cool great uh thanks for listening to the politics joe podcast uh like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast we'll see you on the next one ciao Woo. <laughs> <laughs>